hear first from the Ryerson team. Their spokesperson is Graham Klim, and with him are members of his team. They're in the audience. There is Syed Hashemi, right here. Tayo Shonibare, right there. And Winta Ibreyusus. Did I get that right? Yeah, you get it. Pretty good? All right, so all the people here, they've got their um, Idea City Scholar t-shirts on, and if you want to follow up in conversation later, they're right here. But in the meantime, we're going to hear from Graham. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting us out, uh, Moses. I guess I'm here to bring us back down to Earth. We've been on the moon for a while, so let's get back to business here in Toronto. Um, so I'm very privileged to be here to represent my team, as Moses called it. There's some in the audience, and there's some that couldn't make it today. Um, but hopefully, I can do our project justice. So ultimately, we started our project off of one man's vision. In 2013, Elon Musk released the SpaceX Hyperloop Alpha document to the world that detailed his vision for the fifth mode of transportation, the Hyperloop. His vision had pods traveling through vacuum tubes at speeds close to that of, of sound, so 500 or 700 miles per hour approximately. It would use any combination of wheels, magnets, and air bearings for levitation, and would use a similar technology to an electric car for acceleration down the tube, as was demonstrated earlier by Rob's presentation. And most importantly, the Hyperloop itself is extremely resistant to extreme weather conditions, hail, snow, ice, that would normally ground aircraft, uh, cause insane amounts of traffic, or cause your train to be delayed. You don't have to worry about that in the Hyperloop. So just imagine waking up in Toronto and going to work in Montreal in about 35 minutes, or by the proper numbers now that we've heard today, maybe about 39 or 37. Uh, fundamentally, that'll change the way we live our lives. Uh, that, just to put that into perspective, back here in Toronto, um, I live up near Downsview Station, so once I get on the subway at Downsview, it takes me about 35 minutes to get to Ryerson University uh, every day for school, so really big game changer here in the Hyperloop uh, can make that happen. So why am I here talking to you? You've heard from a company today that's bringing the Hyperloop to life, but my team and I started our Hyperloop vision exactly two years ago today, very strangely enough, but on June 15th, 2015, Elon Musk tweeted to the world that he would be hosting a Hyperloop competition uh, for student teams from all over the world to bring and innovate um, their ideas of the Hyperloop um, to accelerate the advancement of its uh, designs and also to promote it around the world. In support of the competition, Elon and his team would build a one-mile test track, as you can see here on the screen, outside of their uh, Hawthorne, California rocket facility, uh, which we had the privilege of visiting this past January. Uh, the competition itself would be split up into three categories. Uh, one category would have teams that would submit proposals of pods with intentions to build it. Other category would have uh, the team submit a concept for a pod with no intention to build, just to provide ideas. And the subsystem category. So being a young, enthusiastic uh, student at Ryerson, I decided this was something that I wanted to be a part of. And upon returning to Ryerson in 2015 to start my master's, I quickly put together a team of three graduate students, including myself, and three advisors, one academic and two industrial, uh, to submit our intent to compete in the September 2015 uh, deadline. So from there, we had to decide, how are we going to be part of this competition? What are we going to do? What's our ideas? Well, we quickly decided that we wanted to be part of the subsystem category. This would enable us to put together a very detailed, high-quality design in such a short amount of time and with such limited uh, size of a team. We had to find inspiration, though, so we quickly studied the Alpha document in, in detail, and we eventually found a line of text in the document that read that the Hyperloop should utilize a retractable wheel system, or rather deployable wheel system, in case of low-speed travel and, high, and emergency situations. So this was a no-brainer for us, because I just spent two years of my career um, as an intern working at the aircraft landing gear company Safran, just outside of Toronto here. And we had two advisors, industrial, on our team uh, from the same company. So we figured that this was the best opportunity for us to come up with an innovative solution for the Hyperloop, and a meaningful one at that, in a short period of time. So we set out to build the world's first Hyperloop deployable wheel system as a subsystem entry in the competition. 
So by December of 2015, out of over 1,000 teams that committed, submitted, their, uh, uh, um, <laughs> submitted their intent to compete in the competition, we were one of 124 teams remaining from 26 states and over 20 countries all over the world. This map is amazing. It does it justice. You can see just how worldwide the Hyperloop initiative is. So in January, we descended, January 2016, we descended on Texas A&M University. We got to hear from great speakers like Elon Musk and the Secretary of Transportation at the time in the US, Secretary Fox. We also had the great opportunity to network with student teams from all over the world just to see how their vision for the Hyperloop compared to ours, exchange ideas. Yes, it was a competition, but we were all there to lay the foundations for the fifth mode of transportation. And we were also joined by other teams from Canada, um, such as University of Toronto and Waterloo, which you'll hear from later today. So it was a very great experience. And we were fortunate to, again, submit our design in the judging uh, category of the subsystem. So in this area, the judging criteria related to detail of design, strength of supporting analysis, uh, the overall quality of the presentation, and the scalability and economics. So could our system actually be used on a Hyperloop one day? Well, to meet all this criteria, we had to deal with the constraints put by the Hyperloop and the environment that it operates in. So as mentioned earlier, the Hyperloop operates in a near vacuum, low pressure environment. So you have to deal with some aspects related to uh, what you would deal with on a spacecraft. So you can't use liquid lubrication. You have to use dry lubrication for various joints and stuff. So you, you have to consider things like this. And we also had to deal with the very small space constraints of the Hyperloop pod itself. So we imagined at the time a Hyperloop pod no more than eight feet in diameter. So we had to fit our wheel system as well as leave room for all sorts of other systems that a Hyperloop pod may contain. Uh, so in order to do this, we had to make a system that could operate and function within a very small space. We came up with a unique, innovative hybrid extension and retraction system, which is kind of detailed there. You'll see a larger picture later, which is currently patent pending. So we're very thrilled about that, and we were very thrilled to be recognized uh, by the judges uh, and win the SpaceX Subsystem Innovation Award uh, for, to represent our university and obviously our country as well. So we were very thrilled about that. Thank you. Thank you. So just when we thought that all the hard work was over, the hard work was just about to begin. We quickly turned around and came back to Canada in February 2015 and took the challenge of actually bringing this product to life. So you see here, this is the, the final design. Looks a little bit different from the original one. We had to make it, first of all, manufacturable. So we were actually going to build this thing, so we had to make sure that someone could actually build it. So we spent the next two months from February uh, till about March and April making detailed design drawings, communicating with the machinist, um, using all of our resources to come up with a, a system that we'd actually be able to make and eventually test. Uh, so we ended up coming up with a design that could go to 180 miles per hour. So it was perfect for the Hyperloop uh, test track made by SpaceX. Um, it was, again, inspired by the traditional aircraft landing gear design. And it was functional in the small spaces that was required. So and most of all, and most importantly, we were building a system um, that was going to be you know, shown at SpaceX. So Elon Musk, SpaceX, Tesla, it had to be electric. So we made it fully electric. So just to give you an idea of how this will work in the whole Hyperloop mission profile, as I call it. Um, so you're arriving at the, you're at the main station. You're loading cargo on board. Uh, you're loading people on board. And at that time, your pod will be resting on the wheel system. As you begin to accelerate down the tube, maybe from 0 to 100 miles per hour, your wheel system starts to retract into the pod, similar to an aircraft landing gear, and your pod will go down onto its magnet or air bearing levitation system. After some time at cruise, you know, when you're coming into Montreal, just the city outskirts, your system starts to deploy. You come into the station, and you get off the pod. Simple as that. So in order to meet this mission profile, we had to meet some very key features. A system had to be quickly retracted and extendable, especially in emergency situations. So we were able to do it in less than two and a half seconds. We incorporated an active stabilization feature using sensors. So this was important because imagine you have a Hyperloop tube inside of another tube, um, and this pod is very low to the ground because you're using magnets and air bearings, so it has a very short distance. So once you're on this wheel system, you can have the same effect when you're braking as you do in your car. So imagine you're driving along the highway, and the person in front of you, red lights come on. What do you do? You brake, sometimes very quickly. So your car jerks forward, and so do you. Well, it turns out your car actually dips forward down towards the road. 
Um, your car is high enough above the ground that it has clearance so you never actually hit the road, unless it's very fatal and that might be like a big spin effect. But um, so we actually put in this um, active stabilization capability to counteract that. So when you break and the pod would start to kneel, you actually would stabilize back out to a planar uh, motion. So, and most importantly, we also used an oil and gas system for shock absorbing, which would give you and enable a smooth ride uh, while you're in the Hyperloop tube and while the wheels are deployed. So we had to bring this concept to life. We'd finished the drawings, we'd had everything ready. Now we needed the resources to make it happen. So we went to academia, industry, to come up with inevitably 20 sponsors uh, from all over the world, uh, France, US, Canada, a uh, very international group of sponsors, Germany even as well. Um, so these sponsors all together came up with over $200,000 in financial support, product, and um, software sponsorship. So we couldn't have done it without them. And simultaneously at this time, we expanded our team from three graduate students to six students together, four graduates and two undergraduates, and two of the new members are sitting here in the crowd, so we're very happy to have them here. Um, so by using all these resources that we were given and the faith that was given to us by these sponsors, um, in May 2016, we started manufacturing key components, as you can see here. By the summer, we started assembling these components, installing key aspects, and getting ready for the final um, installation and final uh, assembly, which took place in the fall of 2016. And then we were able to begin starting testing. So you see here, uh, this was a really cool picture. I liked it, the four wheel systems, like a little assembly line. Um, so we have, all together we built five Hyperloop deployable wheel systems. The four you see here would inevitably go on a demonstration pod unit that we made. We call it a demonstration chassis, which you'll see later today. And we also had a single unit system that was used for testing, calibration, and demonstration purposes. So as I mentioned, testing, one of the most important things. So you can build something and you can say it works, but you need to prove that it works. So we took our testing very seriously. We had the fortune of having access to the testing facilities where they test aircraft landing gear just outside of Toronto at Safran Landing Systems. And Tayo and I in this picture were setting up a test for our first full system test of our Hyperloop deployable wheel system. And I have some test footage uh, that we collected from December and January testing as we led up to the final phase of the competition that I'm going to share with you today. So just to put it into perspective for you, um, this is a, the Hyperloop wheel system kind of tilted. 90 degrees, so normally the wheel would be on the bottom. Uh, but for testing purposes, we set it up like this. The large aluminum discs that you see on the side uh, were purposely selected uh, as the same aluminum as the test track built by SpaceX. So you have the same characteristics when the wheels are interfacing with each other, the same frictional characteristics. Um, the, the aluminum wheels could spin up to a high RPM that would simulate the speed that the Hyperloop pod would see. So even though the wheel system is stationary, these wheels would spin the wheel system up so it would feel the same loading and effects as you would at very high speeds. So I'm going to start that video now, and it's going to run through station one to station two cycle, so arrival to departure, cruise speed, acceleration, and deceleration. So we were very pleased to see that it worked perfectly fine. And had we had the opportunity to put it inside the SpaceX test track, we think it would have performed tremendously. Um, so we had the opportunity to attend the, the final phase of the SpaceX competition as a subsystem team to demonstrate and exhibit our work. We brought down a, a chassis system that I mentioned earlier uh, that was able to, it was a 10 foot long system and it was able to demonstrate the self-stabilization capabilities that I mentioned. Uh, we had people come up and push down on it uh, we even had um, a member from Hyperloop One, Shervin Pishvara, come in and test it out as well. So we had a lot of cool audience members come by um, and give it a try. We had the opportunity to witness um, some Hyperloop uh, pod teams race their pods in the track. There was three teams that got to do it. It was a pretty exciting experience. And just to share our work with everyone and to see what all the other teams had done over the last few years. So just to put it in perspective, this all just came to conclusion in 2017 of this year in January. So it was almost a two year long process for all of us and it's been a wild ride for sure. So just to put it back into perspective and kind of with the theme of disruption, disruption can come in all shapes and sizes. 
We were only six students and five advisors at one time, maximum. So for us to come up with this, you know, we had a lot of people that said, oh, it's maybe not possible in the time period you have, but we proved them wrong. We did it, and we're very happy that we did. It's been a life-changing experience. We hope you're just as excited about the Hyperloop as we are, and we hope that one day we'll see our Hyperloop deployable wheel system or something similar to that on board one of the Hyperloop pods. Thank you very much for your attention. Well done, Graham. Thank you. So if I understand correctly, if your idea really, really, really works, maybe Rob will pick it up in his much larger assembly. Is that, that what you're hoping nice. for? I yeah? would love to have that. Does this amount to a kind of job application? Well, I have a job that I'm quite happy with, but I'd be more than happy to kind of arrange a meeting between the two companies to see what could happen. So we'll have to see. OK, well, if you play your cards right, Rob, you might get a crack at this thing. Yeah. Thank you very much, Graham. Thanks a lot,